I'm going to record this. So as I advertised, I did prepare some slides on talking about topological methods because we are really running out of time to cover the subject in class. And so uh, uh, I, I might still be able to do a few things in class uh, next week, but uh, I'd like to make sure that I can discuss these things before we wrap up. So uh, that, that's what I would like to do uh, today in this discussion section. So let me show the slides and uh, can you see them? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'd like to talk a little bit about topological methods. And uh, the, I do have a lecture note only half written, topology.pdf from B courses. So I, I mean to uh, uh, keep writing and filling the gaps uh, on, about subjects I'm gonna uh, hopefully talk about today, but uh, it's still sort of not ready. But nonetheless, uh, this, I hope that's a useful resource to look at anyway. So the one thing I'd like to talk about is one example where topological arguments had proven to be extremely useful. That is about quantum Hall effect in condensed metaphysics, which has to do with something called chern simon term, which I mentioned uh, this morning, but I'd like to actually mention this again and now. So that's uh, the first half of the subject that I talk about. If there's still time left, I can start talking about some example of topological defects. That's again, another example where topological arguments come in, in an important way. Again, both in condensed metaphysics and particle physics. So they just imagine that you're looking at some complicated system and you don't know exactly how to analyze it. But at least we know that the gauge invariance is very important. And so uh, if you're looking at the property of certain material or certain system at long distances, then the gauge invariance tells you the way the, 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 the electromagnetism come into play is only in the form of either E squared or V squared. If the system exhibits also magnetism, then you might have a coupling of the magnetic field to the magnetization of the system, but nonetheless, what you can do is without getting into any details of the system, you can start writing these terms of the effective action when you integrate this complicated system out, assuming all the degrees of freedom are gapped so that you are allowed to integrate them out, then the long distance consequence of the system can be encoded only in a couple of parameters like dielectric constant and magnetic permeability. If there's a magnetization, of course, that's another parameter. But nonetheless, you can actually start looking into what is called the low energy expansion. So this is a very useful idea that you can encode the properties of the system only in a couple of parameters because you know what kind of terms are allowed in your 1P effective action after integrating out all the, uh, the, the gapped modes. So that's the generic statement, and, and this is actually an extremely useful way of looking at whatever system you're looking at. So what, as a result, typically, you have these parameters which correspond to E squared and B squared in your effective action, and hence dielectric constant and magnetic permeability. But it turns out the two plus one dimension is quite special especially when you have a magnetic field, namely the parity is violated, because you can write yet another term which appears at a lower dimension compared to E squared and B squared. I remembering that both E squared and B squared, the field strength has one derivative already. You square it, so you have two derivatives in these operators. But what is called chern simon term is written down here has only one power of derivative, so if you're looking at the lower powers in the momenta, which correspond to longer distances, then this chern simon term, if present, will be much more important than E squared and B squared terms. So that's just because the, 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 if you look at the dimension of these operators, E squared will be dimension four operator, so it's uh, B squared, but chern simon term is dimension three operators, and lower dimension operators are always more important at long distances compared to higher dimension operators. So if you have two plus one dimensional system, and if the parity is violated, you would expect the chern simon term could well be there, and that plays an important role, much more important than E squared and B squared. So that's the first statement one can make. And, and this is allowed only in two plus one dimension because the chern simon term, as you can see here, has three indices, 
contracted with the Levitz-Civita symbol with three indices. So this is possible only in three dimensions, two plus one dimensions, not in four dimensions, for example. And the important thing is that when you write this term in the effective action, you know this coefficient k actually has to be an integer. And that's something I went through rather quickly this morning, so let me actually repeat the statement here. So Chern-Simon's term is nearly gauge invariant. If you're making infinitesimal gauge transformations, the gauge transformation is the total, total derivative. So to the extent that you ignore boundary terms, it is gauge invariant. So that doesn't restrict anything about coefficient here. But if there are a set of gauge transformations which winds around in, in a non-trivial way topologically with basically winding numbers, which correspond to non-trivial class in homotopy group, those gauge transformations can change John simon terms in a way that, that corresponds to winding number of the gauge transformation. And the point here is that very similar to the case of the point particle around the monopole I mentioned earlier this morning, you want to make sure that e to the i action, which goes into the exponent, so e to the i action is single valued, which allows the action itself, John simons terms, to change by 2 pi times integer, which doesn't change this e to the i s. So the gauge transformation may change the John simons term by an integer multiples, but as long as the coefficient here is also an integer, then the change in the exponent is two pi times integers so that e to the is is single valued. And so that is actually okay, which in turn tells you that the coefficient of the chern simon term must be quantized. So that quantization actually turns into the quantization of the integer quantum Hall effect that the whole conductivity is quantized in certain unit and I, and I will tell you that actually in the next couple of slides. But anyway, do, any questions about this general argument? It's okay? So maybe it, it makes better sense once you see uh, this John Simon's term in action. So what we imagine is that you have two dimensional system and you apply a magnetic field through that system. And let's for the moment assume that there's no boundary to the system. So identify uh, the opposite size of this rectangle and that makes it a torus. So think about that situation first. And in that setup, uh, you can uh, 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 study what the gauge transformation would do on the chern simons term. So uh, the first thing to actually relate the coefficient of chern simons term to the core conductivity, and I come back and talk about this quantization condition from the gauge invariance in a moment. So the idea is that you have some complicated system with interacting electrons subject to magnetic field. They may be interacting with impurities and, and, and the system is strongly coupled and fairly complicated. But no matter how complicated the system may be, uh, end result of integrating those degrees of freedoms must lead to a gauge invariant uh, effective action and so I argue that the chern simons term is a candidate for it because e to the i s can be single valued and gauge invariant. Suppose that is the case, then what you can do is to take a variation of both sides of the equation with respect to the vector potential. And if I do this for the right-handed side, where whatever fields you might have, scalars, fermions, whatever, would couple to the vector potential then coupling the vector potential goes to the, uh, the electric current. So the, the, the variation of this path integral with respect to the uh, vector potential would insert the electric current into the path integral. So this is basically the expectation value of electrical current. On the other hand, if I do this on the left-hand side of this equation, namely taking the variation of the chern simons term with respect to vector potential, then you find the electric field because the chern simon term can be explicitly written out in this form here. So this is the, uh, uh, the term that is made of scalar potential times the magnetic field going through this uh, xy plane and the, also the, the exterior product of vector potential in the electric field. 
which points in the z direction, which is a scalar quantity in two plus one dimension. So this is the way it looks like. So when you take variation with respect to vector potential, you can pull out this electric field, but this is actually cross product. So they are actually orthogonal direction. So as a result, when I take the variation of chern simons term with respect to vector potential, I end up inserting the uh, electric field in the perpendicular direction. So if you compare both sides, you find this result that expectation value of the electrical current along the x direction is proportional to the electric field along the y direction. So this is what is called the whole current. The current flows in the direction perpendicular to the direction of the electric field you applied. And that coefficient is what is called whole conductivity. So from this chern simons term, you now have a prediction that whole conductivity is given by e squared over 2 pi times an integer. And of course, here I completely left out h bar. If you try to recover it, 2 pi to get, comes together with h bar, and that becomes a Planck constant instead. So the whole conductivity is quantized in the unit of e squared over h uh, with an integer multiple. And this is what is called integer quantum whole effect. And so in principle, this kind of system is fairly uh, complicated. Uh, uh, the, uh, the initial experiment was done by gallium arsenide. It's a particular type of superconductor, and it tends to have lots of impurities in the system, and electric current doesn't flow very easily in the system. But nonetheless, it turns out that you do find this whole current. And uh, this is the, uh, the experimental data that shows these plateaus in the whole currents. And what is shown here is actually inverse of the whole co uh, conductivity matrix. So that's why this has a unit of resistivity instead of conductance. Uh, and so these plateaus correspond to these quantized values. And what's shown by these peaks, these sharp peaks correspond to the current that flows along the direction of the electric field. So that's definitely not whole current. And that seems to flow only when you are in the transition from one plateau to another. So for vast majority of the values of the magnetic field, then your conductivity is completely constant in a quantized fashion. And so since a very robust behavior of the system, and this robustness has to do with the fact that this whole conductivity uh, is, arises because of this nature of the topological quantization. So that's what I need to explain next. So why is this value k uh, needs to be quantized in the integers? But anyway, so this is a very simple analysis. And no matter what complicated system you may have, end result must be gauge invariant. E to the i trans simon terms is gauge invariant as long as k is, is integer. And that already allows you to derive what the whole conductivity should be, and which comes in, again, an integer multiple of a certain quantized unit. So that's a very one-line derivation why you would expect such a phenomenon to happen in the two plus one dimensional system thanks to the existence of this chern simons term. So I will go ahead and talk about this quantization condition K next, but any questions about this uh, idea that you can derive this conductivity out of this chern simons term by looking at this path integral expression? Uh, so is the reason that you only have Chern Simon actions on your left hand side because you only care about the long range phenomena? Yeah. So uh, if you look at more, more details, of course, these higher dimension operators may play some role. But to the extent that you're only looking at the long distance behavior and the bulk material you can study in your laboratory is already something like a centimeter size, which is a long distance compared to atomic scale physics. So taking the lowest dimension operator always is a very good approximation. So that's what I'm doing here. So Chern Simon action is the only gauge invariant action that is relevant for long distance? Yes. Okay. That's the only dimension three term I can write uh, uh, in terms of the gauge fields. Thank you. Any uh, other questions? Uh, Professor, speaking of dimension three, I think like, is it true that we can also write Chern Simon term in any alternate? All dimension? That's correct. So yeah, you yeah. can write it in one dimension, for example. And that actually turns out to be nothing but the coupling of the point particle to vector potential. Mm 
And that's what we used this morning uh, when we talked about magnetic monopole. That, so it can be considered as a one-dimensional chon simons term. Okay. And five-dimensional chon simons term, we don't have an experiment being done in five dimensions. So it might sound like academic interest, but it turns out that because the five-dimensional chon simons terms uh, can be written as a surface integral when you actually take the, uh, the uh, infinitesimal gauge transformation, that is exactly how you obtain the impact of a normally in four-dimensional theory. And that can be also used as a, a part of your Lagrangian describing, for example, the pions or mesons in strong interacting system called the Cairo Lagrangian. So this five-dimensional Chern Simon terms does play a role in understanding four-dimensional physics. I see. So in this case, why we don't have like the dimension one, like say if it's if it can appear, why do we have a dimension one term? So if we have a additional point particle coupled to the system, you can have that. But what I'm writing here is that assuming that you have integrated at all the degrees of freedom in the system and you are only interested in the long distance behavior of the system, which is in response to the external electric and magnetic fields, then the gauge field is the only thing you got. And then I this see. is the only John Simon terms you can write. I see. And other like higher terms just like doesn't dominate at long direction, a long yeah. distance. So we just show yeah. that. That's right. So if you have a system that doesn't break parity, like in the absence of magnetic field, then but you don't have John Simon's term. So you look at whatever is the lowest dimensional operator in that case, which typically is, as I said earlier, either E squared or B squared. I see. But okay. in the presence of John Simon term, John Simon's term is much more important than higher dimension operators. That's why I want him keeping John Simon's term here. Yeah. Okay. And the beauty of discussion here is that just this dimensional argument uniquely singles out the John Simon's terms in the long distance limit, which then uniquely leads to this quantized the whole conductivity. And so the rest of the discussion is why this K needs to be quantized from the requirement of gauge invariance. Okay, so let me move into this discussion. So this is the way you can write the John Simon terms uh, as you have seen already on previous slides. And, and for now, let's consider the following topology. So I consider space to be compact without boundary, let's say S2, a torus is fine too. And the time direction is one dimensional. And I also make it periodic for the proofs of discussion here, uh, like in the finite temperature case. So the space has no boundaries, it's a compact space, and time is, doesn't have ground boundary either, and it's periodic. So in this setup, I consider a gauge transformation on the John Simon's term, which is time dependent, but spatially constant. So gauge parameter e to the i theta depends on t, but not on x. And also we know from the discussions this morning that when you integrate this magnetic field here together with one factor of e over two pi, that is always supposed to be an integer. So I've shown this in the case of both torus and sphere in two dimensions. And this is actually always true uh, according to the, uh, the, the index theorem. So this combination of the integral is just simply given by the integer. So when you consider this spatially independent gauge transformation, the only thing that changes is the time component of the vector, uh, the, the gauge field, namely scalar potential. So the scalar potential changes by one over E times theta dot. And because theta doesn't depend on space, the all integral I have to do on space is the integral of the magnetic field, which turns into an integer. So the gauge variation of the chern simons term then turns into this quantity, k, that's the overall coefficient, one factor of e got eaten by this magnetic field to give you an integer capital N, and the other factor, little e, together with change in A naught, is the only thing that remains in the integral along the time direction. And I made time direction periodic. And the change of the, the scalar potential is given by theta dot as under gauge transformation. And that eats another factor of E, so that's gone. And theta dot time integral can be done uh, within this time interval tau. So end result of theta of tau minus theta of zero. So these are two boundary values.
And in order for this gauge transformation to make sense on this periodic time direction, theta has to be uh, 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 either uh, uh, completely periodic or can differ only by two pi multiples of two pi's so that e to the i theta is single valued. So theta of tau minus theta of zero can be zero or the multiples of two pi. And if it is a multiple two pi, I get this expression over here. So k times n, that's an integer, times two pi times n, that's also an integer. And, and so the end result is two pi times integer times k. And this is the gauge variation of the chern simons term. And as we talked about, any action is in the exponent e to the i s. So if the chern simons term changes by two pi multiples of integer, then e to the i s is single valued, and therefore it's gauge invariant. But if this coefficient k were not an integer, then you can always find values of capital N and little n so that this gauge variation would make e to the is not single valued, and that's not allowed because that value is a gauge invariance. So that's how we know this coefficient k has to be an integer to be consistent with the gauge invariance of the theory, which in turn leads to this topological quantization of the whole conductance, and hence integer quantum hole effect. So that's the reasoning how a topology plays a role in understanding the quantization of the whole conductivity in this two plus one dimensional system. Okay, any questions about this argument here? Um, so, so just to be just to be clear, so the the um, the fact that the b integral has to be n comes from like the phase, the single valuedness argument from like this morning, the same type mm -hmm. of thing. That's right. It's already here. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I basically use the single valueness condition multiple times in this argument. So the fact that e over two pi b integrates an integer has to do with the single valueness of the gauge transformation on the two dimensional space. And on top of it, I'm using this one dimensional periodic time and, and, uh, and requiring single valueness in that direction to obtain this, uh, uh, the, 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 the change of the, the chern simon terms. And further, in addition, I require that e to the i chern simon terms is single valued under gauge transformation. So I'm using the single valueness argument three times. And that's the end, uh, end, end, end of discussion here. So that, that leads to this quantization condition on the whole conductivity at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussions? Okay, good. But what that also means is that there is something about the boundary of the system which leads to the existence of something called the edge states, which is an important consequence of this uh, quantum hole effect systems. So we so far use the space to be without a boundary in a compact space. But let's open this up now. So space is now two-dimensional disk, which is given by this kind of cylindrical shape. So the vertical direction is the periodic time and the horizontal direction is space, which now has this boundary. And once the chern simon terms is on this space with boundary, when you do the gauge transformation, there is actually a boundary term that looks like this. So the boundary term is boundary in space and still integrate over time. And this dx is now a line integral along the boundary because I have done integration by parts and to pick up on the boundary term. And this uh, the, the actually projects the electric field along this uh, loop integral. So this is how much the action now changes under gauge invariance. So now with this boundary, it looks like the gauge invariance is lost because now action changes, even when k is quantized to be an integer. So it looks like this is a problem. But it turns out that this kind of boundary term can arise if you have what is called the edge states. Namely that if you have a wire fermion, 
and while fermion refers to a fermion with only one chirality. So let's say you have only left-handed component of the fermion, but not right-handed component of the fermion. Then you say that's a while fermion. And if you have a fermion running around, around this boundary, and that's why I call the edge states, then this is a one plus one dimensional fermion coupled to electromagnetism. And one plus one dimensional fermion, as we talked about at the beginning of discussion normally, actually doesn't conserve the number of fermions. So number current is no longer conserved because you know, the negative energy states might stick above zero or positive energy state may sink below zero. So number of states can change and therefore it does lead to anomaly. So as a result, the, the uh, path integral fermion that gives you this determinant of the Dirac operator, which is a function of the gauge field, is no longer gauge invariant. So when you change the gauge field by del mu theta and for this Dirac determinant, it changes its phase. And that change is given by the same quantity, the gauge parameter theta times the electric field integrated over this boundary of the system, which is two-dimensional. So if you put these things together, what it means is that if you have a theory which is described by the Chern-Simon term, by itself may not appear to be gauge invariant, which requires then that it must be accompanied by this edge state of fermion on the boundary so that the, the product of these two is actually gauge invariant. The physics has to remain gauge invariant. So the fact that this integer quantum hole effect seems to be well described as John Simon's term, then requires that there must be this edge state fermion, which is either left mover or right mover, so that the, uh, the path integral over this left mover right mover would precisely give you the kind of anomaly which compensates the gauge non-invariance of the chern simon term, so that the whole theory is still gauge invariant. So this is a very interesting example where topological property of the chern simon term then dictates an existence of a degree of freedom. And that's why this is called topologically protected phase. Namely that you have a new degree of freedom, which is gapless, remember chiral fermion is massless fermion, in order for make sense, the theory to make sense, namely the gauge invariance is still preserved. And so this is a, a line of arguments which you can use for all these topological protective phases of the material where certain uh, consistency condition of the system would dictate certain gapless states must exist. And for the case of the quantum hole effect, that is this edge state that must exist. And then this is the way you infer the existence of certain degrees of freedom in the system. And indeed, these edge states have been um, uh, 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 discovered experimentally. So this is how this topological argument is very powerful. You, in, in any of these arguments, I did not use anything to specify sort of details of the system. All I needed to know is the overall gauge invariance of the system and the fact that the system is two, two plus one dimensional, nothing else. But knowing only that lead to this requirement that the whole conductivity is quantized an integer and, and that must be accompanied by the existence of edge states just because of this couple of slides of the, the arguments that don't depend on details. And this is how topological arguments are being useful in quantum field theory. Any questions about this argument? So, so the churn simons term plus the, the whale fermion would be manifestly gauge invariant? That's correct. Okay. And we have also done this in the, the five dimension or four dimension this morning. So starting with the five dimensional churn simon term, when you do a gauge transformation of it, then that turns it to the surface integral, which is now four dimensional. And that four dimensional term was nothing but the anomaly uh, of the fermion under the gauge transformation. So if you have a theory which relies on five dimensional John Simon's term, that in turn would require existence of massless fermions in four dimensions, that would be sort of the higher dimensional analog of this argument. 
And, and in fact, the uh, existence of particles like bottom quark and top quark have been predicted based on that argument because people have discovered what is called tau lepton. That's the first third generation particle. And tau lepton by itself gives you gauge anomaly, which makes the theory inconsistent, which is reflected by five dimension John Simon's term. Therefore, the theory has to be accompanied by existence of four dimensional degree of freedom, which corresponds to in the end bottom quark and top quark, which of course later on was indeed discovered. So it, the range of our arguments is exactly the same. The theory has to be gauge invariant. So if you see part of the theory which seem to violate gauge invariance, you can then predict there must be additional degrees of freedom that will cancel this uh, anomaly effect and to maintain the gauge invariance of the overall system. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. But some of you might start to complain because there's additional uh, uh, discovery called the fractional quantum F4 effect. And the uh, integer quantum Hall effect led to a Nobel Prize to uh, von Klitzing. The quantum, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect that was discovered later uh, also led to uh, three gentlemen to receive Nobel Prize. And so in this case, the whole conductivity has a shallower plateaus, which correspond to this fractional conductivity. An interesting thing is that all of these fractions have odd denominators. And clearly, effect is not as prominent as the integer quantum Hall effect, but uh, there is a plateau for these values, which means there is some robust state, which is, again, rather insensitive to details of the system so that you can have this plateau. And again, these uh, vertical uh, spikes correspond to the conductivity along the direction of the electric field, which represents sort of transition from one plateau to another. So you seem to see sort of very similar behavior, except that now these uh, the conductivities are fractional. So how do we understand that? Because the argument I presented earlier really didn't depend on much details. So the only thing that can go wrong with that argument is if there are additional fields we have to include in the discussion. So I implicitly assumed so far that after the end result of integrating out all these uh, gap degrees of freedom, the, end, uh, the, the system depends only on the electromagnetic fields, but nothing else. So I made that implicit assumption. So that's the only thing that can go wrong when you try to explain this fractional quantum Hall effect. So it turns out that there is one extra degree of freedom one can consider. Again, that is also in the context two plus one dimensional system, which is called statistical gauge field. Uh, uh, and, and so this little a is sort of similar to gauge theory, uh, but uh, this is meant to be an auxiliary field without dynamics, just like what we introduced for the case of the gauge fixing procedure. But what this field is special is about is that it can change statistics of other particles. So what I'm doing here is to couple a churn simon terms are given in terms of this uh, statistical field A mu. So this is churn simons term, just like in the case of the electromagnetism, again with a coefficient k. And I couple this to a point particle here, so if you integrate over space first, then this turns into time integral. And, and so this A uh, field then evaluated where the particle is. So this reduces back to the point particle Lagrangian. But the reason I actually wrote it this way is because then I can write the whole thing as three-dimensional integral with which I can take the variation with respect to the statistical field A to write down the equation motion for it. And if I do so, then the variation of the churn simon term gives me k over 2 pi times the magnetic field when I take the variation with respect to A naught. On the other hand, the, the variation of the, uh, the coupling to point particle would give you a charge density localized at its position x naught. So what this action tells you is that there is a magnetic field glued to the point particle with a delta function. So this John simons term then attaches a magnetic flux 
to every particle in the system. And once every particle carries a magnetic flux, and when you think about, the, let's say, one particle uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, circling around the another particle, then there's an hollow uh, bone phase associated with the magnetic flux, so that this particle will pick up a phase which is given by the amount of magnetic flux, so e to the 2 pi i over k. And if you instead try to interchange two particles, then you don't go all the way by 2 pi angle around the other one. The only thing is, is by angle pi, so that you inter interchange them. Then the phase you get is, of course, half of that. So I get a phase of e to the pi i over k. So if you imagine, for example, k is 1, then e to the pi i is minus 1. So that actually gives additional sign when you interchange two particles. Namely that if I add this John Simon's term, I can change the boson into fermion or fermion into boson. So that's why this field has to do with the statistics of the particle. If you assign this John Simon's term coupled to the, the whatever field you like, like electron, then you can describe electron as a boson with John Simon's term instead of the fermion with the anti-commutation relation. And in addition, you can even consider the k to be not 1, but 2, 3, and so on. Then you can have this fractional phase when you interchange particles. And this phase, in principle, can be any phase. So that kind of particle is called anion. And that's possible only in 2 plus 1 dimension. So I took these pictures from electronos I wrote for 2 to 1 in B when I introduced this idea of quantum uh, 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 statistics. And when you think about a path integral of the identical particles, then in the case of the identical particles, not only you sum over all possible path in this periodic time direction, you are also supposed to add path where your particles are interchanged between initial time slice and a final time, time slice. So if we have three particles, there are three factorial ways of the changing particles. So there are six of them. And three of them correspond to even permutations. Three others correspond to odd permutations. And when you do the path integral over these possible paths, then you are supposed to assign negative sign to odd permutations and uh, assign positive sign for even permutations and sum over all possible interchanges for the all possible particle path when you identify uh, perform path integral for identical fermions. But what you can see here in this picture is that when you have two plus one dimensional system, so space is two dimensional, time is one dimension, then you can even assign an orientation in these exchanges. Therefore, if you interchange two particles this way, you get an assign a phase e to the i theta, while assigning the opposite phase e to the minus i theta when the interchange happens with the opposite orientation. Namely that whether you interchange particles with clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise rotation, you can assign different phases. So this is the situation with anions. So in two plus one dimensional system, you can have this weird statistics. And that can be described in terms of the John Simon's term. So the idea is that once you allow for this extra possibility of adding this John Simon's term uh, for the statistics of the field, this is yet another field you can consider. And therefore, you have extra freedom in having the, uh, the effective low energy action which in turn allows for the fractional quantum hole effect, it turns out. So that's what I would like to demonstrate next. So but any questions about this point? Um, I do realize this sounds super bizarre. <laughs> is, there a, is there like a more concrete interpretation of what the additional degrees of freedom are other than like this field that controls the statistics, the exchange statistics? Um, well, this is the only one I know, actually, in two plus one dimension, but I don't know a proof. So but this I, is but one I guess thing like I know. In, in, like, in the materials that like, un, un, like have a host of fractional quantum Hall phase, like what, mm -hmm. is, what, what actually is um, the 
uh, composite, you know, the, 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 what are the, what are the constituents of the fractionalized degrees of freedom exactly? Yeah. So I, I, I once I get to a discussion on the quantum whole system itself, hopefully uh, at least I, I answers part of your question. Okay. So let me get to that. So this is the way I can use it, which goes back to a paper by Jan Hansen and Kevelson uh, back in 1989. And there are many ways of talking about fractional quantum whole states, but this is at least one way of doing it. So in, in quantum whole systems, we are talking about a system of a bunch of electrons strongly coupled with each other. But using this trick of using the statistical field, I can instead describe electrons as a boson field coupled to this statistical field. And I need to choose this denominator of the coefficient of the chern simon term to be odd, so that I can assign odd magnetic flux to electrons, which is a boson here, so that when you change two electrons, it ends up giving you a minus sign as an effect. So the describing electrons as a boson plus chern simon term is supposed to be equivalent to talking about the electrons as a fermion. But once you actually write it this way, that gives you an actual question, could there be a Bose-Einstein condensate for this boson field? And what is easy to see is that Bose-Einstein condensate cannot exist if it's coupled to magnetic field, because magnetic field would disturb the phase of the, uh, the boson field. Only when uh, the, this, this uh, boson field can acquire condensate is when magnetic fields cancel between the real magnetic field you uh, 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 exerted on the system and the statistical magnetic field. And the amount of statistical magnetic field can be worked out just by taking A naught derivative of this action, that's equation of motion, so that magnetic field, which A naught derivative of chern simon terms tells you, is proportional to the density, number density of this boson, in proportionality is inverse of this coefficient. And so what I just said is that the Bose-Einstein condensate can exist only when the magnetic field cancels, namely that this statistical magnetic field is canceled by the real magnetic field. This condition then tells you the number density has to take particular value, namely one over two n plus one times Eb over two pi. And EB over 2 pi corresponds to the occupancy in Landau levels. So what you discover then is the number density of this boson has to be an odd fraction of the entire the filling of the Landau level, which in turn leads to a fractional conductivity. And I didn't show it here, but you can again take the derivative of this action with respect to the real gauge field and work things out under this condition and you find indeed that this one over two n plus one is the conductivity, and therefore you get a fractional conductivity, thanks to the fact that you have this additional degree of freedom in the system. So this is how you use this statistical field, which sounds very bizarre thing, but ends up having this physical effect that, that you can have this now new kind of Bose-Einstein condensate where the magnetic flux is canceled by the statistical magnetic field, which in turn gives you a condition that number density of this Bose-Einstein condensate is related to magnetic field in such a way to realize this fractional uh, whole conductivity. I hope that answers all the question Max asked. Yeah, that's that. I think this this does mostly address it. I guess just for a little bit more detail. So, if you somehow had if you if you if your material had uh, actually bosonic electrons somehow, mm -hmm. it couldn't could it would it would it not be possible to have a fractional quantum Hall phase or would it still if you ran this argument through with two m instead of two m plus one it would still apply maybe I guess. Um, uh, so in this case, no. Uh, so if you have a fundamental boson to start with, I guess yes. Then you can put two m here. But uh, yeah. we know electron is fermion, so in order to describe electron system as a Bose-Einstein condensate, you really do have to flip from fermion to boson that restricts the denominator to be an odd number. Yeah, yeah, I understand for the for the actual for the realistic situation, but I guess mm -hmm. just more like more 
uh, you know, just hypothetically, like you can have interacting bosons give you a, a fractional quantum Hall state. Uh, then, then I suppose you get this uh, even fraction instead of odd fraction. Okay. Yeah, that was okay. Okay. And then one can talk about excitation on top of this condensate. And what you can consider is what is called the vortex. And we will talk about vortex more later on. It's one of the topological defects. And I'm not explaining it really here because we have, we're yet to talk about it. But it turns out that when you consider vortex in this weird Mosnachian condensate, the vortex carries a fractional charge, which had been observed experimentally. So you have this fractional charge for the vortex, which actually moves and you can detect it. And this vortex also obeys this anion-like statistics. It's a fractional statistics, which is difficult to demonstrate experimentally. And so I don't know of a data that really demonstrates it, but this is what is a consequence of this, uh, uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate described using this statistical uh, field. So you get this possibility, which was the you know, academic theoretical possibility of anion I talked about in a couple of slides ago, which really does come out of this system as a prediction. And hopefully at some point we will be able to even experimentally prove it. But right now this is the uh, prediction and it's, it's the hypothesis. And you can also put together these uh, vortices on top of uh, BEC and vortices themselves can eventually form a BEC. So you can have this, what is called the hierarchy of the, uh, the fractional quantum hole effects. So you can start with the, uh, let's say one third if you put an additional hierarchy on top of it, you can get two fifths, and, and you have this uh, succession of various uh, hierarchies of the bose einstein condensate that eventually would explain all of these odd fractional numbers as observed in these systems. So uh, this is a, a, the construction you can do uh, to actually describe this quantum Hall effects using this very simple Lagrangian, now with this trick of using statistical gauge field. So this, you know, is a very bizarre subject, but it turns out to be really what's observed in the laboratory. And this is where the quantum field theory and topological arguments is really playing a major role in the way we understand these systems. So anyway, any questions about that? Yeah, I, I think I have a question. Go ahead, Karen. Like my, my, my understanding Hello, you're breaking off. Fraction is very important. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. So, like my understanding, fractional quantum Hall. If if that, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, my understanding, fractional quantum Hall. In fact, it seems to me the interaction is very important. So for mm -hmm. uh for the for the electrons. I, again, I, I'm not hearing you anymore. Integer Hall effect to the fractional. Uh, sorry, can can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So you're right. So the interactions are very important, and in two dimensional systems, typically there is no conductivity at all. It becomes a, a, a resistance, and and the the, uh, uh, the uh, insulator. Uh, so that's why the current actually flows only on the edge which is really the prediction of this analysis that the H state is what carries the conduct, uh, conductivity. So interaction is very important. And in this line of argument, the only effect of interaction which has been considered is simply the fact that uh, the, the system is gapped so that you can integrate all the degrees of freedom out and, and only look at the long distance behavior using electromagnetic field perhaps together with also the statistical field. So that's the assumption that goes into the analysis. Namely, it's implicit that interaction is important. Therefore, all the states are gapped and you can integrate them out. And that is what leads, leads to this conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, it, yeah it, it is very clear. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. Actually, I want um, to mention there's a there's an ongoing experiment which sort of I think your your explanation makes it uh, th that uh, it one experiment clear to me. There's an ongoing experiment. It's trying to look at the fractional quantum Hall effect uh, in a uh, in a BEC system, like uh -huh. it's bosonic atoms. Uh, okay. And uh, like my my 
yeah, uh, like I'm I'm a little confused uh, uh, is because in 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 that system the interaction is sh sort of short range, uh -huh. uh, it's short range interaction, and mm -hmm. then that that professor who's doing that presentation he told me that uh, it like well it doesn't matter first fractional quantum power effect does not is it does really the, you does not need to uh, have fermi fermionic statistics which you sort of like your explanation makes makes this point very clear to me now okay and second is as long as it, no matter whether the interaction is short range or long range we don't mm -hmm. care as long as right. it can induce a big enough gap that's right that's then right that is all and then mm -hmm. he, he told me basically according to their calculation the their uh the, their bec system uh with the short range interaction mm -hmm. it can induce a big enough gap I so see. um so um so sort of the fractional quantum power effect might work in their system. They're also oh. trying to look at the, uh, uh, like, uh, the anionic ionic statistics. Uh -huh. Aha! Well, that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. 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 That's so some I, ongoing e efforts. Can Can you send me some references? I'd love to look at those. Uh yeah, I can I can tell you whose group that professor the group uh that the, that professor's group. I think mm -hmm. that that part of research is still ongoing. Okay, yes, there's good. no publication yet, but ah, it, they're, they're definitely very serious um, mm -hmm. in that direction. Okay, they, they've that already have great. some, I think they they've have uh, some very nice results um, using the magnetic flux to break the time reversal symmetry. They okay. already, they already, are, they are already able to do that already. Right, right. So, that's so I'm sorry that time is up now, so and, and other people might need to leave. So uh, I hope you can send me an email afterwards so that I get some more information about it. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, great. Thank you so Thank much. You. And today I will not talk about this anymore, but the, there's another whole subject for topological defects I want to talk about. So if there is some time left in the lectures next week, I will do that. If not, I will again come back and talk about this in discussion section. Okay? Any questions? I really lost quite a few people, but anyway. Okay, so I, I hope this subject was interesting and I, I, I'm still fascinated by this subject. So uh, I'd love to talk more about this uh, topological stuff uh, uh, next week, either in the class or in the discussion section. All right, so uh, uh, have a good weekend and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.